got his picture and everything. James, make sure the mic is on. Okay. Yeah. You good? Don't. I love you, man. You. Just take your liver. Thank you. Well, y'all hear me good? James, hold on. I can get all the announcers, and I don't want Cheryl mad at me. Uh, is it on? Is the slide that talked about the ladies are having a brunch? Yeah. You were playing them. Thank you, Sister Lori. The ladies are having a brunch this week while we're doing the uh, the feast feast. So if any of you ladies want to come to that brunch, you please come on out, enjoy time here at the church. And I can't read that because I got glasses coming next week. <laughs> 11 o'clock, okay, 11 o'clock. Eventually, I'm going to be able to see who's on the back row. Then y'all all in trouble. All right, you good? How y'all doing? I'll start, start with prayer. Father God, I thank you for this opportunity you've given me to come up here and, and to bring forth your word tonight. Lord God, I ask that you anoint my lips to speak. And you give me a sense of calmness, Lord God, and let this word to be received. In Jesus' name, amen. So, coming up on uh, the April 7th, I'm going to give share y'all a little bit where I come from. April 7th, we set foot in this church, me and my family. And it was on the recommendation of uh, friends of ours, Sammy and Beth McCormick. And they, they approached us about coming here. It was years prior. and. We kind of shrugged it off. I did. I shrugged it off. But it was always in the back of my mind. So time came. And it kept working on me, kept working on me, right? I had a lot of, a lot of issues I was dealing with. In my past, I was a very, uh, very angry, hateful individual. I would go out of my way when you did me wrong to get back at you. It was all revenge. And it, it was, I was very hard-hearted towards individuals. I had no compassion whatsoever. But the day that I set foot in this church, like I told Pastor Jerry, I don't remember a word you preached that day. I don't remember a song it was sang. I know that the weight that was on me was lifted when I walked through those doors. And the way it has been since has been good. I wouldn't trade it for anything. So. I've been married 18 years. We, we just renewed our vows, had a real wedding. I figured I'd do that and make it right. So we, we, we got married just a piece, but we did our real wedding here because the wife said she wanted a, uh, a church wedding in front of our church family. So that's what we did. We've got, uh, I've got two daughters, Emily and Annabelle. And Emily's in the back area, sitting back area. And then we just brought in our niece, Madison. So, and, uh, it's been good. So, a little bit about me. Uh, I guess we'll dive off into this. And uh, I guess the title of this, what I decided to call it, was What You Say Matters. And turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're going to start in verse 26. Now, leading up to this, Goliath had been coming out and taunting the Israelite army, giving them a hard time. Morning and evening. That was the first thing they heard when they got up and the last thing they heard before they went to bed. They were struck with fear because this big fellow's coming out and, and talking down to them and threatening them. And he's coming out alone. So automatically that becomes a form of intimidation. He's got the courage to come out and the arrogance to come out and step out alone against this entire army. So David was sent by his father to bring bread to the front lines. And David heard this. So David responded. He said, David asked, The men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Well, stop there at 26 because where was he speaking from on that? Because he, called, he showed up and he heard, he heard Goliath talking. He heard Goliath taunting. Well, he, he spoke, I feel he spoke out of love. He spoke out of, just like we would if a family member or a friend of ours was threatened or, or somebody was attempting to attack him. So David, it was said, David was a man after God's own heart. 
right? So, number one, in Psalm 18, the Lord was his rock and his fortress. I wanted to know what it, what it meant to be after God's own heart. So this is where this comes up. Number two, Psalms 23, the Lord was his shepherd. And then number three, the Lord was his light and his salvation, in Psalms 27. And in four, the Lord was his strength and his shield, Psalms 28. And in Psalm 25, the Lord was his trust. So David was talking out of love for God. You had somebody coming up and threatening the Israelite people that were not going against them, just them, but also going against God, God's chosen people. So we'll go on to 27. It said, they repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking, with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. I want to know why did Eliab respond in such a manner as that? Because David was only speaking. But you look further ahead, further back, and David was anointed in the presence of his brothers. He was anointed king, so it was out of jealousy. So Eliab tried to belittle David for being a shepherd. He tried to knock him down a notch and question his heart, tell him, you're wicked for we just want to see the fight. You're here to only see the fight. And so he questioned him. Well, what did David do? In 29, David says, now what have I done? Said David, can I even speak? So David, David he stopped him. He says, what's your problem? Why, why can't I talk? I'm just talking. Well, then David does what? He turns away to someone else and brought up the same matter, and the men answered him as before. You want to shut somebody up that's negative in your life, what do you do? You just turn your back on. Act, act like they're not there, <laughs> right? And that, that's, that shut him up because you don't hear nothing else out of, out of Eliab after this. But what David said was overheard. It was reported to Saul. So Saul sent for him. So sometimes what you say, you're going to get called up on the carpet for. You're going to have to give an explanation for what you just said, and you're going to have to back up what you're saying. So David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. So David had the faith that he would go, he would be able to go and fight this man. As little as he was and as young as he was and as big as this guy was, David had the faith that he was going to be able to go fight this man. Well, Saul questioned him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David, again, he spoke out of faith. David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep when a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock. He said, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he defied the armies of the living God. Lord, who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine, said Saul to David. Go and the Lord be with you. Something David said. I mean, these words that David said out of faith Something he said convinced Saul. What he said, it was either his passion, the way he said it, or you can see it in his eyes that he believed that he could, could defeat this giant, that he could defeat him. So what he said gave Saul the faith. Saul could have chose anybody. Being king, he could have picked anybody from that battle line and said, You're, you go up, you fight this man. You know, I'm, I'm ordering you to do so. And they would have, to, they would have had to do it. But something he said, being a young boy, convinced Saul that he was able to do this. So what did Saul do? Saul put the whole Israelite army at risk of being slaves to, to the Philistines. And David stepped out in faith. And David's faith increased Saul's faith. Right? So, 41. So meanwhile, the Philistine, with a shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw 
that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. I'm going to stop there. Me and Pastor talked about this. He said, why do you think he despised him? What says it right there? He was glowing with health, and he was handsome. So this fellow was nine foot nine inches tall. The Bible says he was three cubits in a span. That's a cubit's three foot in a span of nine inches. So he's nine foot nine, and he's been a warrior, like Saul said. He's been a warrior since his youth. So I couldn't imagine that he looked good. I mean, he's been getting beat up on his entire life. So you don't get good at war by, by not getting hit. So I can only imagine. He was a very big, ugly-looking fellow. I couldn't imagine somebody nine foot nine being any kind of pretty. So yes, he, he just, he, yeah, he, he. He despised David for that. And he spoke out of arrogance when he said, he said to David, am I a dog that you have come with me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. Out of arrogance. He didn't know what he was fixing to go up against. He didn't know who he was going to fight and what David had been doing to prepare for this moment. David said, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you. In the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. So, this day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands. And I'll strike you down and cut your head, cut off your head. This very day, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Not one time did David take credit for this. The entire time, he was given God the glory for this. He was given God the credit for his strength. And he was, he was making it known that it was by God that this battle was going to be fought. Right? I'm 47. 47. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into his hands. So where it speeds up a little bit. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly towards the battle line. He met him, reaching into his bag, taking out a stone. He slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. And after that, what happened? The Philistine army, seen, they, seen that giant fall, they seen their hero hit the ground. So what'd they do? They turned tail and ran. What'd that do to the Israelite army? It boosted their faith and their courage. They took off after them. So what you do and what you say is going to affect those around you. So you, you have an effect on people. So I wanted to touch on numbers a little bit. It's not up there on the overhead. But the 12 spies that were sent into Canaan, they were sent by Moses to spy out Canaan. Twelve of them went in. They spent 40 days spying out the land. They all come back with a good report of fruit in the land. It does flow with milk and honey, right? They all agreed. It's, it, the land flows with milk and honey, and, and here's some of its fruits. However, 10 of them had a negative report, and that negative report was radiated throughout the entire Israelite community. The Israelites were waiting. They were waiting for the, for the report to come back so that they could come in and take this land because they knew that God had promised them this land. And because of the negative report of the ten, it outweighed the positive of the two. So sometimes the negative will overpower the positive. But those positive, those two ones, Joshua and Caleb, that, were, that stayed positive with it, that kept the faith with it, they, they tried convincing them that this land can be taken, that God's going to give us this land. So they, they stayed with it. They were faithful. Their blessing was de delayed while the other 10 were struck dead with the plague. Everyone else in the Israelite community, 20 years and under, was able to, 20 years and under was allowed to go into the promised land. After. But the, the ones that were there were not allowed to. Everyone 20 and older were not allowed to step foot in the promised land because they did not keep the faith. They allowed the negative to decide for them. They didn't have faith in God. They didn't trust Him. After all the miracles they've seen, even God said it, after all the miracles I performed, after all the things they've seen, they still chose not to believe. So because of what they said, they said that they would fall dead in the desert. It would be better for them to fall dead in the desert than it would be for them 
to enter into that promised land. It, it'd be easier for them to do that. Why bring us out here and let us die? So God said, that's what you said, and that's what you're going to get. You're gonna, so, so because of their negative report, because of their lack of faith, it delayed the blessing. It delayed their promise. Uh, so, I'm going to go over with Matthew 9. We'll go on to that. Matthew 9, verse 20. Now, this is the woman with the issue of blood. This is, but prior to this, there's a story within this. There's a story before it and a story after it. Jairus was a synagogue leader who had already come and pled with Jesus to come heal his daughter who was dying. He was laying in bed and dying. And he said, if you would just come lay your hands on her, she'll be healed. So Jesus was on his way to do that. Well, in the midst of that, this woman comes along. It says, just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if only I touch his cloak, I'll be healed. She said it. She spoke it. Mm -hmm. she, she gave herself the faith, boosted her faith to do that. So she touched. Jesus turned and saw her and take heart, daughter. He said, your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. But at that time, right after that, people came to Jairus and said, don't trouble the master. Your daughter's died. And Jairus, who already came to Jesus in faith, and said, if you just come here and lay your hands on her, she'll, be, she'll live. And Jesus stopped him and said, don't be afraid. Just believe. So Jesus took and spoke life and spoke faith into Jairus. After this woman had spoke faith over herself, spoke life over herself, Jesus had to turn and speak life over this man to get him back on track. Because again, he was fed a bad report. So they, he spoke up to him. The Roman soldier, the Roman soldier sent his, uh, he, he come to Jesus and he said, my servant lays paralyzed in bed. And he, and he says, well, Jesus asked, should I come healing? He said, no, I'm not worthy to have you come into my house, come under my roof. He said he's humble. He, hum he humbled himself. He said, you just say the word and my servant will be healed. He knew the power that Jesus had in his tongue. So Jesus said, greater faith have I not seen in all of Israel. He, he, his servant was healed at that moment they were talking. So, so in Acts chapter 3, I'm going to start at verse 1. I like this story. This, this one here says, One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from, the, from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, and as did John. And Peter said, look at us. So the man gave him his attention expecting to get something from him. He wasn't ready for what he was fixing to get. <laughs> and Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. Taking him by the hand, he helped him up, and instantly man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and banged it, began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Uh, so at that point, Peter noticed that. Peter took an opportunity to speak to him about the name of Jesus and how much power was in that name. Peter took the time to go over it. And he gave the credit to Jesus for this. All the credit went to him. He's in 16, it says, By faith, the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and now and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. 
So, of course, he was brought, they were captured. They were brought in, in, in front of the Pharisees. No, I'm sorry, the Sadducees. He was brought in front of the Sadducees, and they were questioned. But it was too late. They were trying to stop it. It was too late. It says, because in verse 4, chapter 4, verse 4, it says, but many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew by 5,000. So they seen an opportunity. Peter seen an opportunity to, to preach Jesus' name, to turn people to believe. And he sees that opportunity. Because of what he said and what he did, it caused others to believe. So what you say not only affects you, but it affects those around you. Now, I have experienced, I have experienced what Jesus has done for me firsthand and how powerful that name is. You go ahead, Sister Lori. This is a difficult one for me. Last year in August, the pastor talks to me about my motorcycle riding. I wasn't doing anything wrong on this one. I was stopping at a red light. All right, I had just gotten the motorcycle. I just, it was my second bike. I just picked it up that night. I was going down 2100, going to work that night. I got rear-ended by a drunk driver in front of Walmart. I got hit and thrown off the bike. I would guess that probably, he's probably doing 20, 30 mile an hour when he hit me. Wrapped around the bike. The dent that's on his hood, I don't know if you can see it real well, it's from my leg. Oh, threw me off. And as I was flying through the air, the only thing I could say was Jesus. Come on. When I hit the ground, I didn't feel a thing. I was standing up. I stood up just as quick as I hit the ground. I watched him drive off. And in my mind, I wasn't thinking. I just got taken care of. I was looking at my bike. I said, I just bought this. Are you kidding me? You know, I just, yeah. So people say it's adrenaline. My, my adrenaline was racing because I didn't feel nothing. No, no. I called my wife that night. My first question was, every time I call her, what are you doing? Normal question. I call anybody. Hey, what are you doing? That's my thing. So I called her then. I said, what are you doing? Well, I, I can't remember what she's doing, but she, <laughs> she, uh, I told her, I said, don't panic. I said, but I need you to come get the, get the ramps, bring the truck down here, come pick me up. I just got, got in a motorcycle accident. I was calm. People still said it was adrenaline. I got in that ambulance probably three minutes after I got hit. Ambulance showed up. I think they were waiting around the corner. But, uh, I got in the ambulance, and they checked my blood pressure. Everything was normal. Heart rate was fine. I actually went to work that night. I, went to, I did not miss a day where I was an hour and 45 minutes late to work. But with that accident, there's no reason I should have been, I should have walked away. There's no reason I should have been standing and watching him drive away. But I'll tell you what I learned during that, and this is where it, what you say matters, is that I was asked by the attorney's office, the county, of course, put charges. But I was asked by the attorney's office, what do you want to get out of this? I've already forgiven him for it. I'm not holding on to that. Uh, if I get anything, if anything, my deductible to be paid for my insurance. Fella didn't have any insurance. So I forgave. There's a check coming in the mail. It's going to cover that. But what I've learned in all that is that I have a scripture on the back of my helmet, and I've got a cross on the dent of my tank of my bike. I left it there. I left that dent there as a reminder for me as to what God did for me that night. On the back of my helmet, I have Romans 10, 13. It said, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. So I'm going to use that. It was meant to take me out as a testimony to help to build someone up. Because eventually, this is an opportunity, eventually someone's going to question what that is on my tank. Eventually somebody's going to question what that is. And I want to be ready. I want to be ready to give the words, to say what needs to be said, to speak life into someone else. So. So the main focus of all this is in Proverbs 18:21. It says the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. With your tongue, you can curse someone, you can bless someone. 
You can build somebody up. You can break somebody down. You can start war. You can bring peace. But more importantly, with your tongue, you can speak yourself from a life of sin and call yourself out of death into a life of eternity with Christ. With your tongue, it's, it's, it seems like such a simple thing, but with your tongue, you can cause your own salvation. You know, when God, when God created, He could have chose any way to do so. He could have crossed His arms and blinked His eyes. He could have wiggled His nose. He could have just said, you know, He could have just looked at it and thought it, right? But He chose to speak it. Everything God said in Genesis, when it said, God said, let there be, there was. God used words just like we should, and we've been given power in our tongue. We've been given power to speak life and death. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus, Christ, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This for it is with your mouth, or I'm sorry, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So I'm going to finish out with this in Luke 15, 4 through 7. It says, Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. You, you want to know how much power you have in your tongue? Make all of heaven rejoice when you repent. There's rejoicing in heaven when someone repents. Now, thank you all for hearing me tonight. Thank you. I mean, that was good. We need to be reminded about our tongue, death and life and the power of the tongue. I got a phone call yesterday, and I was with my son, so I didn't answer it. I was nervous about answering the phone just because uh, I thought, okay, now I, don't, I barely know this person. You know, I don't know where it's going to go. And so finally, when, when I had opportunity alone, I, I called her back, and I said, hey, sis, what's up? And she said, Pastor, I need you to pray. I just need you to pray for this lady. And it was that, now it's like, it wasn't nothing what I thought it was going to be. Pray for this lady. She's 62 years old. She has Alzheimer's, and she's, uh, she's not doing good, and she may pass soon. She just, I told her I want my pastor to pray. And uh, I got to praying for her on the phone, and the Pentecostal came out of me and her. Amen. And, I mean, we're going after it. on, the, And I can hear her say, you know, she has dementia, but she knew Jesus. And she knew scripture, and she, she could shout amen. And, and it was just like a little revival going on inside my car. You know, and I think about that, that thought you just said, that, that death and life is in the power of the tongue. We have an opportunity to refresh people and bless people. You don't always have to be mean-spirited. So that's good. Pastor Jason, I want like you to stand, you and your lovely wife. Y'all give these two a hand. Pastor, Son, Harvest Church. I just love y'all. Come here, let's pr and I want you to pray. I want you to close in prayer, if you would. Oh, you know, he's going to bring you up here, too. I think, I think last time I saw you, I was throwing you off a 40-foot tower. Yeah. Uh, it, it, no, and he asked me. Uh, never mind. I won't tell you what he asked me. <laughs> well, you got the good end of the deal. Uh, yes, you uh, did. Yes, you did. Well, she absolutely <laughs> is. It doesn't take us. Well, I know. Listen. But let me just tell you, I, I just want to introduce to, to those that don't know Pastor Jason. I was talking to you as like everybody knew. But, man, I'm so proud of what's happening in Sun Harvest. You know, Pastor Richard and I go way back into the 80s. 82 is how far Pastor Richard Amador and I go back. We've been friends a long time. And I, I just say that, you know, Paul said uh, one man waters, one man plants seed, another man waters, but God gives increase. And for 40 years, that's what Pastor Richard and I are doing. And to see you doing it now and, and so many others coming here, that we just keep on 
planting, keep on watering, keep letting God bring the increase, and to Him get the glory. You know, and it has nothing to do with us. So, and, I, and I know we like to get a scratch on the back sometimes, but it's not about that. I really want God to get the glory when, when I'm dead and gone. I just want people, James, what you're talking about, the tongue. I just want people to remember things I've said. You know, the little, may, I don't care if you call them cliches or jerryisms. Is that what y'all call them, jerryisms? I just want people to remember stuff, particularly you, Keith Sanders. Red-headed stranger. Okay. So if you close us in prayer, if y'all wouldn't mind standing, those watching online, thanks for tuning in tonight at, uh, on holywild.net. And it's good to have your family here, James. Amen. And uh, I've met a lot of them at a birthday party the other day, getting out and keep, keep being a marketplace people. Get, them, get out, get around. To you guys at from Sun Harvest, thanks for coming. Amen. Some of your faces are familiar. And, again, I hope we can get some of you guys to come out to the Beast Feast. I think we're going to have a great day of fellowship be a lot of fun weather holds thank god it wasn't this saturday a nasty saturday but if we get a good saturday uh and if you've not been on our 110 acres out there i think you'll be surprised uh, just how beautiful that place is what a blessing god god has blessed us amen because you went and paid off church amen every every step you step at little country church you are paid off amen debt free hallelujah amen so we're proud of all that amen I got to tell a story real quick about Pastor Jerry before he runs off. So uh, he talked about me. Now I got the microphone. It's my turn. Um, before, some of y'all may or may not remember Pastor Reverend Miles Monroe, but before he passed away, my pastor, Richard, and I went to a pastor's conference with Pastor Rocky and another guy, and it was at uh, Pastor McIntosh's church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we saw Pastor Jerry there. And uh, this was before he got the property to New Caney Church. And uh, the last night there, Pastor Miles Monroe had us all in a circle, and he said, you come here, Tex. And he called Pastor Jerry over there, and he said to him, God has got land set aside for you that you can't afford, and God's going to take care of everything. And within a year later after that, something like that, Pastor, it happened. But what really, sh really showed me something about how precious this man is is we left there and went to Denny's. And me, I was a young, ignorant, hungry, spongy believer because I was brand new and I was getting the devil saved, you know what I mean? And, but to sit at this table with these precious, seasoned men of God, I was soaking it all up, man. And as we're leaving, this elderly woman who had been, and now mind you, by this time it's about 3 or 4 in the morning, and this elderly woman had been at Denny's by herself all night. I believe she was an angel of the Lord. She walked right by him and she said, Sir, I got to tell you something. And he said, yeah, yes, yes, ma'am. She said, as you were speaking, I saw you consumed with fire. And the more you talked, the more the fire grew. And me, I'm like, huh? <laughs> what? What is going on? This is, this is staged. Well played, Pastor, you know. And, but, that's, <laughs> <laughs> but what it showed me is, is man, God is a God of the redemption. God is a God of enough. And what, what he is is precious to the body. And, and I served, I, I was at this church for a very short time, but there's very few pastors that I'm in covenant with, and he is certainly one of them. So I love you, Pastor Jerry, and I thank God for you. I really do. Thank you, sir. Well, Father, we thank you, Lord God, that this is the day you've made. God, this is the day you've made, Jesus. You knew this day would come, God. You knew that you had set aside James Barnes many years ago, God, to declare your gospel. What an anointing on his life, God. What a purpose, what a plan you have for that precious man and his lovely family. We thank you for sharing him with the body. We ask you, oh God, that you continually to give him every desire, meet every desire he has, God, because he is after your heart, as David was, Lord. He calls you God. He calls you Father. He calls you his beloved. We thank you, Lord, Father, that where two or more are gathered, there you are in the midst of us, Holy Ghost. We thank you for communing with us tonight, O oh God. What a press prep privilege it is, O oh God, to be your children in such a time as this. As we see things in the natural falling down around us, God, we thank you that we still remain. And, God, that you make every crooked path straight for every family that we belong to, oh God. We bless, we bless, we bless the little country church, God, and everybody that calls this church home, oh Lord.
Thank you, Father, for giving us destiny, for giving us purpose. Thank you for reminding us, God, that you first loved us. We bless you, Jesus. We thank you for this night. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, amen. Amen. God bless you guys.